guess today came all the way from Baltimore? Is that right? Close enough. Close enough. Uh, his name is Daniel Toomey. He is a graduate of the University of Maryland and the author of several books, including The Civil War in Maryland, Marylanders at Gettysburg, and The Maryland Line, the Confederate Soldiers Home. He is co-author of Baltimore and Ohio during the Civil War, I'm sorry, Baltimore during the Civil War, and Marylanders in Blue. And he has lectured for a number of historical organizations, as well as the National Park Service and the Smithsonian Institution. His course, The Civil War in Maryland, has been offered at a number of local colleges in that area. He's also contributed to radio and television programs and two Civil War battle videos. He is a member of the Surratt Society and the Maryland Arms Collectors Association, Company of Military Historians. He serves on the Maryland Military Monuments Commission and was project historian for the Maryland Memorial erected at Gettysburg in 1994. He's won numerous awards for his historical research and exhibits, including the Gettysburg National Battlefield Award in 1985, and was the 2001 recipient of the Peterkin Award given by the National Park Service at Fort McHenry for his many contributions in the field of research and preservation. He is currently guest curator at the BNL Railroad Museum with a five year exhibit entitled The Working by Train, commemorating the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Here is Daniel Toomey. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I fell in love with the state of West Virginia when I started this project. Uh, I was asked to design this exhibit, which is the largest Civil War railroad exhibit ever created. And I said, well, this is going to be easy. I wrote the Civil War in Maryland, I'll just fill in the railroad history. And I found out 60% of the story happened in a place called West Virginia, and I had never been west of Harper's Ferry. So, so I straightened up and met some wonderful people, and this is my second time to Wheeling. I, I've been to a few places. I had the honor, and I mean the outright honor, to be invited, yes, to the uh, statehood celebration at the Capitol. I was the only non-West Virginia person on the dais that day with the governor and everybody. So I was truly, truly honored. But it's a it's a joint venture, and if you all come visit the museum, uh, the working by train exhibit will run until the end of uh, next year, until the end until November first. Like I said, it, it's the largest Civil War railroad exhibit ever created. It changes each year in part. And uh, if you close your eyes and drove down there and didn't know where you were, when you got in there, you wouldn't know where you were because it's much West Virginia. As it is in Maryland. But for the story today, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Civil War, but we're going to focus on an unusual time period, not so much for you folks, but for the rest of the country. We're going to look at the first 90 to 100 days of the war. And, and my, well, the overall story we tell is the war came by train. My specific title today is The First Front. And I'll make a thesis statement and then we'll see how well I do by the end of my lecture. My thesis statement is that during the first 100 days of the war, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was the first military and political objective of the war. So we'll see how it plays out. Now, the slides are important. So if anybody can't see the slides and wants to move, go right ahead. Don't, don't worry, that's what you're here for, to see the things. Uh, one of the things I was immediately, and then another, I believe in being honest with my audience. And I honestly knew absolutely nothing about railroad when I started this. So you can imagine what a what a blank tablet project this was. But I really gained an importance of the being know it wasn't something just because I got it off my shirt. And I'm just gonna give you just a couple of brief facts to show you why the BO is so important. Uh, at, by 1860, uh, the BO had 514 miles of track, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the main line ran from Baltimore to Wheeling. There was a thing called the Washington Branch, which you'll see a little bit of today. That was only 30 miles, but it went off the main branch into Washington, D.C. It was the only rail connection between the nation's capital and the rest of the world until after the Civil War. The only direct link. So the Washington Branch is very important. As a matter of fact, because of that, our logo showed the you know, with the nation's capital, and that's how that came about. Then, of course, there was the Northwestern Railroad, which went from Grafton to Parkersburg. Another 104 miles. So we had about 500 miles of track, but it's where it is, not how long it is. How big was the BNO? Uh, at this period of time, the BNO operated 4,000 cars and locomotives, and then employed about 6,500 people. 
well, let's face it, but it came to town today and said they have a job for 6,500 people. You know, we'd love to see them. And just to give you a, a comparison, 4,000 rail cards for the BNO. The state of Virginia, which included you guys back then, had 12 different railroads and together had over 1,000 less rail cars than the single BNO. So you see, it was a, it was a major thing. Now, in the annual report of 1860, John Mark our president, made a statement. He said, our road has, attained now, has now attained a condition to challenge the comparison of any other line in the country. But this didn't come easy. The BNO closed the line. See if I get this right now. Right? Making its way. Don't forget, the BNO Railroad is called the BNO because its charter says, build a railroad from Baltimore to the Ohio River. And that's how we get here. So it closed the track uh, on Christmas Eve of 1852. But what did it take to get there? The BO was founded in 1828, and it took 24 years to put that sign up. During that period of time, the railroad was the first commercial railroad in the United States. It virtually had to invent rails, ties, switches, locomotives, rail cars, brakes, couplers, everything that goes into railroad, they had to invent. And they began to make it the Mount Clare shop, which is now, now the museum. They also, if they had been out in Iowa or someplace building a railroad on flat land with nothing, they had to completely out of game. And to do that, they had to build tunnels that had never been built and bridges that had never been built. Now I mentioned the Washington branch of the BNO. This is known as the Thomas Viaduct. It's a stone orange bridge built on the curve across the Pasco River Valley. It connects the Washington branch with the main line. This bridge was built between 1832 and 1835 for locomotives the size of a Chevy Pot. That bridge has been used every day since and is used right now by the CSX. Think about it. The Romans could be better. So these guys, they were beginners, but they knew what they were doing. Well, you can't talk about the Baltimore Iron Railroad without talking about Baltimore City. Real quickly, this is, this is our, our, our starting point. By 1860, it's the third largest city in the United States, the second only to New York City in the region, and it was the largest industrial city in the South. Now, give you again a quick reference. Population, 212,000. <coughs> Richmond, Virginia, 150 miles south, future capital of the Confederacy, had 38,000. Excuse me. Um, I mentioned it was also the largest industrial city in the South. The Canton Iron Works had the largest rolling mill in the United States in 1860. Not Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Chicago, anywhere else. All of them. We made plates for the monitor, as a matter of fact. Factories made everything, sailcloth, canned food, anything you could make, you could imagine that you would need, especially to fight a war. And shipyards. We, uh, so we had a ready supply of ships, captains, crews, dry docks, fleets, they had everything going for it. And of course, without question, railroads. Now Baltimore, I hope I don't get too many people's way, Baltimore was serviced by four railroads, the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore, came down from Philadelphia, the second largest city in the United States. The Northern Central came straight south from Harrisburg. You had the little Western Maryland. It wasn't very big, but it was very important during the Gettysburg campaign. And then you had the b &O. And you see this dark line. This is the Washington branch, and the main line coming all the way out here. And then there's a little railroad called the Annapolis and Elbridge Railroad. For those of you not familiar with Maryland geography, this is the Chesapeake Bay, Annapolis is our state capital, and there's a little 20 mile railroad that connects with the Washington branch. All this is going to be very important for our story. So that's the lay of the land, and uh, I'll try not to lose you with you know, too much geography back, back my way. Um, I this is great because I've given this lecture all over the country, as far away as Wisconsin. And most people know where Baltimore is, but it's a bit of a challenge to you know, figure out where Wheeling is. <laughs> and so I'm starting at the end of my story today, and uh, I'm very, very happy about that. I want to interject something again to support the story about railroading, and that is the fact that you've probably heard this a lot. The Civil War was the first modern war of a romantic war. I buy into that 100%. Just to give you an idea. And, and a number of technologies 
came about during the Civil War. Um, submarines, balloons, machine guns, all kind of stuff, barbed wire, uh, that kind of thing, landmine. Uh, I have to mention that because I always say the two, the three key things are the rifle weapon, whether it's a musket or a cannon for, you know, deadly killing, and the telegraph and the railroad. And I made that statement one time, and some old retired Air Force guy said, Yeah, but they had balloons! Well, I did have one or two, but, but all these technologies did manifest themselves by World War I. But for the Civil War, the immediate, immediate impact came from the rifled weapon, the railroad, and the telegraph. The telegraph, by 1861, uh, 50,000 miles around the country, from the north and the south. The railroad had uh, 31,000 miles of track, more and more than the south. But the thing I like to uh, key in here is two things. Both the telegraph and the railroad were fully established and in use when the war began. So they're ready to go. During World War II, like you folks know, we had to mobilize. The singer sewing machine had to start making machine guns. They had to turn, turn over. There was no turnover for, for gearing up. The railroad and the telegraph were in place. And the, and the most important thing about this, I'll say, is that this is my opinion for what it's worth. They combined the telegraph and the railroad, conquered time and distance on the battlefield, and changed warfare forever. Well, let's move ahead. Uh, just, this is a uh, whole class of stuff here, but we'll get to our topic. Uh, now, real quick, just to give you. So at the time zone, so you folks remember that, we're going to be talking about the first roughly 100 days of the war. April 12th, 1861, firing on Fort Sumter. Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the reunion. April 17th, Virginia secedes from the Union, and troops begin to move in a different direction. In Baltimore, oh, I always like to point this out. This is the main line of the BO. Running out to see Grafton, Wheeling, but it's important. Virginia secedes from the Union. When Virginia secedes from the Union, Maryland, here we are in Maryland, up here, is the only southern state north of Washington, D.C. This is the most critical period for the Lincoln administration, it's the first hundred days of the war. Because if Maryland secedes from the Union, Washington, D.C. is located behind enemy lines. Not a good way to start a war, and like starting a chess game with your king on the wrong end of the of the table there. So this, this is a critical moment, and I will to you for just a second. We really want to appreciate history. Don't look at it backwards the way you know what happened. Go back in time and get with the folks and come forward, because they didn't, didn't, didn't know what was going to happen next. So this is a very, very pregnant period of history, this 90 days we're going to talk about, 90 days, because we know the answer. They didn't, they didn't know what was going to happen. Now, on the 18th of April, remember I told you all these railroads in Baltimore. On the 18th of April, five companies of Pennsylvania volunteers come by train to Baltimore. Um, the, the set of the stage explains, I'm going to tell you three stories at once. I can't do that. So, we've got to pretend we've got three TV screens back here. We're going to look at three football games on Sunday, but we're going to do one at a time. And that's really how this plays out, because it's, it's in three different places, but it's all happening about the same time. So the first game is going to be held in Baltimore. And the first troops come by the uh, Northern Central Railroad, five companies of troops. They're marching through Baltimore. And a small pro-Southern mob gathers. They start bombarding with curse words, cheers for the Confederacy, and a few Baltimore paving stones. And poor Nick Biddle, a pretty black man, by the way, who was in the Washington Artillery of Pasco, PA, gets smacked in the head very severely, and could very well be called the first casualty of the Civil War, right on the streets of Baltimore. Now they make it through town, they get on the train and, 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 uh, at uh, Mount Clare Station and they go off to Washington. So you have five companies of very beat up unarmed troops in Washington at the time. But just as an aside, this little unknown moment in history of folks was a big deal for them. And after the Civil War, they came back to Baltimore every year and held a dinner party and remembered the fact that they were the first defenders for the Union. They were the first troops to move toward Washington. However, things will, will grow in, uh, considerably after that. I mentioned that the telegraph and the railroad were conquering time and distance on the battlefield. On April 17, 1861, the 6th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment formed up in Boston. 
in Boston. And the 75 unarmed, unequipped Pennsylvania companies, this was the first full regiment to answer Lincoln's call for volunteers. They had uniforms, they had weapons, they had bullets, they had a 16 piece band. And they formed up and they would leave Boston on April 17th, 1861. And they, what is significant about this movement is 800 men will move 450 miles over seven different railroads and arrive in Washington, D.C. in 48 hours. Now, there are some days you can't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Bad weather. Think about it. And for those of you that do study history and, and the Revolutionary War period, comparison, how long did it take Washington's army to move from Washington to York now? About four or five weeks. So, putting troops in some other place in 48 hours was just a new way to do it. Business. So this is why I say the telegraph and the railroad would conquer time and distance on the battlefield. Now they arrived, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Baltimore, seen the Inner Harbor, but at one point in the Inner Harbor, the Philadelphia one there's the Baltimore Railroad Station there. Uh, the only part left today is this part right here, and it's the Baltimore Civil War Museum. Now, Baltimore was serviced by four different railroads, but there was a unique law within the city government that no locomotive could go through the city. So all the railroads had to disconnect their locomotives and hook up horses and, and pull the cars one at a time. And, you know, this is a good map here. So we got, we got President Street Station, and you have some crash street. This is all the inner harbor you see on television. You watch an Oreo game or a Ravens game. This is the inner harbor you hear about. Come around here, the Howard Street, and this is Camden Yard. That uh, mount's called Porto Park in Camden Yard. But this was Camden Station in Camden Yard. So each train, each car by itself is going to have to make that trip. But you need to the truck. And there is Camden Station. Again, this time you watch an Oregon game, I guess a lot of your Pirates fans or whatever, but whatever they come to Baltimore, you'll see that structure. It's still there. That's the front of the stadium. As a matter of fact, you guys have some very old buildings here in Baltimore, despite the Baltimore fire and urban renewal, has three Civil War train stations still in existence. This is an example of a horse driving through town. Uh, and you have to understand the makeup of the people of Baltimore. And we, we tend to get a bad rap because of uh, the press we riots, but northern papers just they were all roads. Up the bottom. But Baltimore was a mixture of people. Matter of fact, there was a Baltimore area called Charm City, Monumental City. During this day, it was called Mob Town. And it was called Mob Town because we had a combination of pro unionists and pro southerners. And then, if you ever saw the movie Gangs of New York City, that could have been filmed on Pratt Street right in front of a hard rock cafe because we had all these gangs like the American Rattlers and the Pogo Police, and they wore those goofy looking costumes just like they did in that movie. And they, you know, they, they were rough. So you have all these different people in, in the city, not just one particular you know, group. And as the cars moved through Pratt Street, one at a time, they go, oh, look, there are soldiers in those cars. Oh, look, they're Northern, they're Yankees, they're Boston, look, they're abolitionists, let's get them. But by the time the seventh car comes through, it gets stopped at Howard Street. And 220 men under Captain Follinsby is cut off at the station, and we'll have to make that march. And if he makes that march, all hell breaks out on Crash Street, and you have the first land battle of the Civil War. I know you're not supposed to say that in West Virginia. The first land battle of the Civil War is on Crash Street, April 19, 1861. Four soldiers are killed, 36 wounded, a dozen civilians are killed, and uh, who knows how many wounded because civilians don't follow after action reports. Now, they get, the, they get the Camden Station, they get on the train, and they make it to Washington. So the good news is Mr. Lincoln now has a regiment of armed troops to help guard the nation's capital. The bad news is, what's going on in Baltimore? His worst nightmare just came true. Because the people of Baltimore don't know what to do. Let's face it, nowadays we're spoiled. If you have a snowstorm, if you have a hurricane, if you have a zombie attack, you know, your local people have these plans on the shelf. What do you do? You know, snow, snow removal plan, uh, hurricane warning, whatever. Nobody had a hurricane warning for a civil war. So the city council, the governor and the mayor got together and said, what do we do now? 
Well, they decided they didn't want to go to the war with the South, but they didn't want to leave the Union either, so they would try to be neutral. And they would burn all the railroad bridges north of Baltimore and tear down all the telegraph lines. And as the mayor of Baltimore said, enter a period of armed neutrality. We were neutral, but everybody was carrying a gun. Now, like I said, this is this is very bad news for Mr. Lincoln. So we enter this this this, this, this vacuum because Maryland is teetering on secession. Remember that right map. The only southern state north of Washington, D.C. So there's a lot on the table with this. Okay. Enter the first hero of the war for the Union. Usually I got a big laugh or burning or something. <laughs> okay. Who's Ben Butler? Got to introduce Ben Butler. There are a couple things you have to know about Ben Butler. Ben Butler is a political general from Massachusetts, which means he has no military talent whatsoever, but he can get votes for Lincoln. He's following the 6th Massachusetts by one day with the 8th Massachusetts, making the same route by train. And he gets to Philadelphia, and he's told by uh, Joe Patterson, you, you can't make it through Baltimore. Now, Ben Butler was a political general, like I said, he had no military training. After Baltimore, he will go to New Orleans. He will become the administrator of New Orleans after he's captured in 1862. Uh, the ladies there are very, very rude, the southern ladies, to the northern soldiers. So Ben issues a general order that says any woman who's disrespectful to a Union soldier will be arrested for prostitution, which in the Victorian period is quite a deal. Well, the people in New Orleans were so impressed with Ben that they painted his likeness at the bottom of their chamber pots and brought him every morning. <laughs> and you can buy reproductions of those in my As a matter of fact, I've seen them. They also stole put so much silverware on with him, they called him spoons. And eventually, he ran the So this is the first hero of the war for the Union. Now, Ben gets to Philadelphia. He finds out he can't get through Baltimore. So he goes down the Susquehanna River, a very big river near the that's why you stay alive. No bridge. They had a ferry boat called the Maryland. An iron ferry boat designed to take rail cars across the river. <coughs> he captures the boat, sails down to Chesapeake Bay, lands at Annapolis, the Naval Academy, the Annapolis Dock, where he is warmly greeted by Captain Blake, Commander Blake of the Naval Academy. He lands his troops, and coincidentally, the 7th New York is there on the second boat. Now, I'd like to show this picture because this is the end of the Romantic War. This is the 7th New York marching down uh, broad, uh, Broadway on the 19th of April, flags flying. Every soldier, this is one of the most famous military units in the state, every soldier was given a red velvet camp stool and a bag lunch from Del Monte Cody. That's going away from him. And off they went to war. They'll land with Ben and, uh, and Annapolis. Now, Annapolis, and it's the state capital, but it's an area known as Southern Maryland. And this particular part of Maryland is just as southern as Louisiana, black and brown. Part of the white folks, big tobacco plantations, major con uh, uh, major population of slaves, and there's no industry, it's just tobacco farms, no railroads or anything. It's a very, very primitive area, the oldest area. So it's a hotbed for secession, though, and that's where the state capital is. Well, Ben takes over the Naval Academy, protects that, takes over the state capital, nullifies any uh, state legislature action there, and he realizes that there is a railroad, 20 mile railroad, the Annapolis Mountain Railroad, which runs to Annapolis Junction and to Washington. Annapolis Junction, you've never heard of, but you've all heard of an NSA headquarters, and that's the Annapolis Junction, so now you know what we're talking about there. Well, Ben is not a general, but he's a thinker. He thinks outside the box all the time. So he tells the head of the railroad he wants to run trains to Washington, and they say, he can't help you, don't have any trains, they're pro -sober. Meanwhile, the local Maryland militia have ripped up the tracks and burned the bridges and things. So Ben does something really historic. He creates the first war train. He put the, takes a flat car, puts a howitzer on it, puts some more troops on, a couple car loads of troops, another flat car, another howitzer. And he begins to move down the track. You see the train in the background there. And as the 7th New York moves along the track, rebuilding it, fire support from the train, and they go all the way to Annapolis Junction. There's a train waiting. The 7th, they rebuild the bridge. 7th New York gets on the train, goes to Washington, and now Lincoln is elated. You welcome the 7th New York town at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Station in Washington. He now has a bypass around Baltimore. Ben Butler, the hero of the day. They make him the department commander of Annapolis. He's in charge of all the 
territory 20 miles either side of the railroad, and he says, stay there with your boys and just keep pushing the troops forward. So Ben, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's behind himself with joy. On May 5th, they expand his operation, and they tell him to take two regiments and battery and move along the Washington branch, which is very important, and go to Relay, that bridge I showed you earlier. That will, that will control the whole main, whole Washington branch and protect that bridge. Ends there. Uh, troops on both sides of the bridge. Remember, Brent Ben was a thinker. And he said, well, I'm in charge of any distance 20 miles either side of the track. All of them out. It's May. It was April 19th, now it's May 13th. And nobody's done anything in the ball anymore. It's you know, vacuum. Because if you push the wrong way, the state's going out of the unit. Well, Ben sends a telegram to John Ward Garrett, president of the Bino Railroad. He says, I need a train. I need a big train. Load and load with both men. I'm taking all my troops to Frederick Brown, up west up the line. The train comes out on May 13th. He puts the man on the gun, lets everybody know where he's going, heads up the track a couple miles, gets to a blind spot, and couples half the train, come so rolling back down, and goes right into Baltimore City on the night of May 13th. Unloads his men, marches up on Federal Hill, plants his guns, sends a message to Fort McHenry, and says, I have occupied Federal Hill with my artillery. If I'm attacked tonight, open fire on Monument Square with your warriors from Fort McHenry. Now, Monument Square is the heart of the city. That's the War of 1812 monument, the symbol of the defense of all war 200 years ago this September. And he's got guns on Federal Hill looking right down the curve. Baltimore City wakes up the next day, that's it. I don't mean they can't begin to have any more recruiting or over operations against the Union. Ben thinks is a hero. Two days later, Winfield Scott hands me. You did what? You took Baltimore, you didn't tell anybody? You realize what could have happened, but that didn't work. So in good military style, he gets promoted to the Major General and sent off to uh, Fortress Monroe, where he does all those wonderful things I just told you about. But Ben has saved Baltimore and Maryland and the eastern end of the Vienna Railroad for the Union. Now we're going to move up the track real quick here. See what you're missing by not right reading the book. Okay. <laughs> this is the famous Stonewall Jackson, but he's not famous at the moment. Remember in time. Now we're back in April, May, early June of 1861. Second TV show, second game. Uh, and you have to appreciate this operation, a term I used, the phony war. During this period of time, the phony war was this. Even though Fort McHenry, Fort Sumter had been fired on, all this operation is going on in Baltimore. You could still, until the end of May, send a letter from Boston to Richmond. You could send a telegram from Washington, D.C. to the Parliament. And if you were a young man who wanted to join the Confederate Army in Baltimore, you went to Camden Station, bought a ticket, took the train to Harper's Ferry, and go off and say, here I am. And the trains were continuously running back and forth. Because everyone really believed the war wasn't going to last. Now, they couldn't really go back to their minds around the idea that this was going to be a four-year war. So anything goes, more or less, until the post office issues of the at the end of May, we're not delivering any more letters. Now, what made this area so important was coal. Once the BNO penetrated the Allegheny Mountain, the number one revenue source for the BNO Railroad became coal. And they built a specially designed triple hopper coal cars in Mount Clare. This is Martinsburg, by the way, so you can see the activity there. And because of the tremendous amount of activity, the BNO had double track <coughs> roughly above Martinsburg to below uh, Carver's Ferry, it's double track. See, back in these days, almost all railroads were single track, and that's why uh, the conductor and the watch were so important, that you weren't on time, you'd run into each other. But to help this, this uh, long jam of coal cars, it was double track right through Harper's Ferry. And where are the Confederate settings since they occupied Harper's Ferry on April 17th? They're sitting in Harper's Ferry right across the main line of the Vienna Railroad. Now, this coal was light. This coal was light. Well, the troops there were all militia troops. They were, you know, just all kind of disorganization. And the governor called on Colonel Tom Jackson to come up and break things out. Now, at this point, Jackson was more known for being a lay professor from VMI than a future Stonewall Jackson. 
who was a West Point graduate, a Mexican war veteran, and he just whips them into shape and creates the thermal overhead from scratch up there. Well, he's sitting there, and these trains are running day and night. And he sends a telegram to John Lord Garrett and says, uh, This isn't, you know, I, I can't have all this traffic day and night in these coal cars. My troops can't sleep. So he tells the being a railroad, If you want to operate your railroad, and you know, this is the phony war period, you can only do it during the daylight hour. Garrett, three things. Number one, the coal is necessary for the Navy Yard in Washington to load the ships to blockade the South. Number two, all the factories in Baltimore need coal. Number three, number one revenue source of the Vienna Railroad, he's a businessman. So if he has to inconvenience himself this way, he'll do it. So he and William Prescott Smith, the master of transportation, schedule all the trains to run through daylight hours on them. Yes, job. It works for a couple of days. Then Jackson sends another message. So this isn't working. He says, too disruptive, my men can't get across the tracks during the day. If you want to run your railroad any longer, you can only do it between 11 a.m. 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> now, all the reasons I just mentioned. Garrett is desperate. You got to make money. You got to get cold. So now this is this is really tight. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. We've got trains lined up at each end, and the last train's got to be gone before the first train gets there. And this goes on for two or three days, just going nuts during the day. And then Jackson snaps the track. He sends Colonel and Bowden down to a place called uh, Point of Rocks. And, and this, is, uh, this is on uh, May 23rd. He says, stop all the eastbound trains, let the westbound trains go. He sends another guy up to uh, Cherry Point. He says, let all the eastbound trains go, stop all the westbound trains. And then at noon, he says, stop everything. So in a period of about two hours, Jackson captures uh, 56 locomotives and 300 rail cars without firing a shot. It's the largest train robbery in the history of the world. Now he's got all these trains, but the problem is this. He captures these fantastic Wyman camels that are built. These are huge locomotives, just running the whole heavy, heavy trains like coal over that mountain. Box cars, which are called house cars, and these triple hopper coal cars that were so important. We had about 100, 100 of these things. Well, um, now the Confederates have been sitting on the main line of being a railroad ever since April and now it's the end of May. Finally, the Union Army gets started, the Patterson gets to come across the river, and the Confederates have to retreat. So Jackson's order to abandon Martinsburg and move down to Harper's Ferry, Barnes Road, and he blows up the big bridge there, and they head off towards Winchester. Now, this is this is what the bridge looked like. I know many of you folks have ever been to Harper's Ferry. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world to be. Those pillars are still there. You take the bridge, you drive across, you look up. The modern bridge, they don't this way, but that's the bridge that's built in 1830. And that's the bridge that, uh, that bridge was built, was destroyed and rebuilt nine times during the war. That's just one bridge. That's how many times. I was suffering during the war. Okay. Now, Patterson was not any better general than uh, uh, Butler. And uh, he, he doesn't see the importance of the main line of the Vienna or anything. He, he occupies and then abandons Martinsburg again. Well, the Confederates immediately come back down the valley and take over Martinsburg, even though Harper's Ferry is occupied. The thing is about a locomotive, you can only burn the first parts. And this is a this is one of those lighting camels after they burned up the wood part, but you know, to burn the locomotive. Now the one thing you have to appreciate is the Confederacy does not have nearly the railroad capacity the North does. In fact, the pop quiz for the day is this. How many locomotives were built in the Confederate States of America during the Civil War? Zero. Zero. So think what the story I'm about to tell is going to be worth the Confederates. Well, here's the problem. Martinsburg, these bridges are all out. There is no railroad that runs south of the valley. There's a 38 mile gap to Winchester, I think it's about 38 miles. Somebody will they'll come and check it out if I'm wrong. It happens all the time in school nowadays. Um, 
anyway, um, so how are you going to get valuable equipment south when there's no railroad? Well, enter Captain Thomas Sharp. Captain Sharp is a brilliant, brilliant railroad man, young guy, captain of the quartermaster corps. He comes up with an idea. What he's going to do is he's going to take locomotives, he's going to jack them up, take the front wheels off, take off the floor, the wheels, the bell, the whistle, anything that can get weight off of. And he's going to put a gigantic set of rollers under the front. It's going to hook up 100 feet, uh, 40, 40 horse teams, like that. 40 horse team, and pull these things along the valley turnpike through Winchester to Strasbourg, put them back together on the railroad, send them down to Richmond to be refurbished, and then distribute them throughout the Confederacy. And in the next couple of months, that's what he does. By the time the uh, uh, Union Army gets the idea that they should take over Martinsburg and reopen the VO, which is about a six month period. He has moved 14 locomotives and 83 rail cars by horsepower all the way uh, to Strasbourg. These cars are disseminated by the Confederacy, and like I said, with the, with the blockade and the limited capacity, they were extremely valuable. Plus, he took 100 miles of railroad track, miles of, I mean, 100 miles of telegraph line, miles of track, turntable switches, parts of 38 other locomotives, tools, lathes, everything. When the war was over, Garrett got an agent to go down because we made everything ourselves, you know, stamped on everything. And his shirt. Sure. And uh, so they sent an agent throughout the South and, and looked for stuff. And we were able to get back 12 and a half locomotives. The Portuguese locomotive, they had taken the power of the, the boiler out, put it in a gunboat, and it got sunk in this river. So we lost one, we had one locomotive lost to a singing. Other footnote to the story. After, right after the war, William Prescott Smith died. He was the master of transportation, and John Moore Garrett needed a replacement. He called Captain Sharpton, who had, uh, had opened the business in Delaware, and said, Any man can steal a million dollars worth of my equipment, moving 38 miles down a dirt road and use it for somebody else. I want running my railroad. And the man that stole all the equipment became the master of transportation for the BNO. <laughs> 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 Garrett was practical. You could do it, you know. He, he wanted you on this side. He didn't hold the right. Okay, last part of our story. While this is going on, we're up here in Western Virginia. Lee is out of command of the United States Army. He says, no, I'm an American, I'm a Virginian, and I'll go, go south. Well, you know, and I'll preach to you guys the history of wanting to be your own state, and how you got treated in Richmond. But he didn't understand this. He figured everybody was a Virginian. So he sends uh, an officer by train from Harper's Ferry, Colonel Porterfield, up the, uh, up the Grafton. And he says, Look, uh, I want you to form four regiments of troops and I want you to defend the borders of, West, of Western Virginia against Ohio and Pennsylvania and create an army up there. Well, he arrives at Grafton, gets off the train, walks into the agent's office of the NL and says, Where is it? Where's the Virginia State Troops I'm supposed to command? And says, we're camped about two miles outside of town. And if I were you, I'd get out of town fast, but we don't like secessions here. So he gets to camp and like, we've got four companies of men, uh, poorly trained, poorly armed, and, and in not too great a period of time, he tells me, look, I can't get anything from you. I can't get any replacements, any supplies. No, everybody's hostile to us. And Lee says, okay, if you can't hold it, destroy it, and fall back. So the first thing he does is burn two bridges at Mannington and Farmington. Well, the local people of West Virginia, they know how important the DNO is to them, their economy, and everything else. So they immediately uh, rush across the river, and that's a great Batman shot of Grafton to the round out there. And they, uh, George McClellan has been made Major General in charge of the Department of Ohio. And his mentality is everybody in Virginia is local loyal, so he's reluctant to come across the river. Well, the folks from this area go, now you don't understand. You know, we're, we're not, we're all about to be in and we'd like to create our own state, and we want to get these rebels out of here. So, unlike the normal slows that McClellan has in, in I would say, Montgomery uh, from World War II, where I was saying, old, 
they said, okay, I'll send you some help. And what they do is, this is Ben Kelly. Kenny, Kelly is a great guy. Uh, my friend, Rick Wolf, something I write about, I write about him. We have a life like Manning, and when I did this matter of fact, life size was just like that. He was a pre-war employee of the Dino Railroad, a pre-war militia officer in Virginia, so he knew both sides of the story a little bit. And he gets command of the first Virginian infantry U.S. out of right out of Wilton. And what happens is, oh, so, so look at that. Um, matter of fact, look at this. Yeah, okay. So what he does is he, he, he launches a movement to drive the Confederate troops out of Grafton. And he'll come by train with troops this way, rebuilding bridges, putting back the rail uh, telegraph line. At the same time, another group is going to come out of Parker Story and do the same thing. So you have a rail board pincer movement colliding in Grafton. And Porterfield, of course, is completely outnumbered. He falls back to Philippi. Now, Philippi, the problem, so, Obviously, they capture Grafton, but the problem is Philippi is only about 10 miles away from the railroad. And uh, Kelly's smart enough to know they're, they're within range to raise the railroad. So he devises a two prong attack where they will attack the main Union forces up there on the hill, and then you see Kelly on the force right there uh, leads the flank attack, and they completely surprise Porterfield, drive the Confederates off. Uh, become known as the Philippine races because the Confederates run away. And it's the first land battle of the Civil War, according to all my friends in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after this, McClellan comes across the Ohio with war troops to get out. And a series of domino effect type situations. The Union Army, with McClellan in charge, gets all the credit, uh, hits the Confederates, and knocks them back. To uh, uh, Rich Mountain, Laurel Hill, and Clark's Ford on July 13th. So by July 13th, all the Confederates are pushed back towards the Shenandoah Valley. Now, the importance of this is, of course, the, the railroad is safe, and those folks trying to work on statehood you know, now don't have to worry about Confederate income. Well, what happens, and what happens on July 21st? That's the first battle of Bull Run. Probably if I had opened this with, what's the first big battle in the Civil War? You always said the first big battle. Wow. First important battle, July 21st, War One. Our entire story has taken place before July 21st. As a result of uh, the Battle of War One, the Union defeat, McLellan is brought north and becomes the commander of the Union Army and creates the Army of the Potomac. But let's go back to my opening statement. The first military and political objective of the war. In the East, Baltimore, say the city and the state of the Union, say Washington for the nation, Harper's Ferry, Grafton, middle of the line, combat, destruct, major destruction of the BNO Railroad, just break military operation, breaks the BNO for six months, Grafton up to Wheeling, what happened? Save the railroad, help West Virginia become a state. The Union Railroad was the first political and military objective of the war. And I would offer today that if you go back in time and visit any of the folks, anywhere from Baltimore to Wales, they'd all tell you they remember the day the war came by train. Thank you very much. I'm good for questions if anybody needs to vote for work or something I understand. Yes, ma'am. Did the problem with the you know, uh, you know, you know, Yes, he was a, he was a, of course, a West Point graduate. He was an engineer. He was a top-notch engineer. Only second, probably, to Harvey Lee during the Mexican War. And then he was a railroad executive. So he understood railroad completely. Yes? The, the branch that, that went from Grafton to Harvey Yes. You mentioned that it was it, it Well, it's let me go back to the name of that thing. I think you call it Northwestern. Yeah, I mean, uh, or am I, you know, not knowing what I'm doing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, so my question is not necessarily. Okay, North, Northwestern Virginia. Okay, here, here's uh, I want to get it. Okay, here's what happened. The B and O. Don't get mad at me. I'm only telling you the truth. 
They know, did not want to go to Wheeling. They wanted to go to Parkersburg for engineering reasons. That's a better way, okay? The state of Virginia said, no, you have to build your first railroad for Wheeling. I guess they wanted to populate the panhandle. I don't know exactly why, but they insisted on that. So once the Wheeling line was built, then they built the Beano Railroad, built the railroad and ran it and kept it on their books, but the official name was not the Beano or after the war. So even though, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's the Beano, but it just doesn't have the Beano's name. It's like subcontracted out. Okay, yes. I understand why people feel Probably were a much more industrialized city, of course, than Parkersburg. But it seems as far as transportation along the Ohio River, it would make more sense to go to Parkersburg because it's further downstream, and so it wouldn't have problems with navigation. Right now, that, I think the book here, The Great Road, explains all that. It's the first book I read when I started this project, was The Great Road. It's a big read, but it explains all the engineering of the B and L, and ends right before the Civil War. So it's the it's a great free read for my book, or my book's a great book to read the way. So my question is really, do you have any idea of what percentage of the uh, of the uh, uh, business and uh, what percentage went to Parkersburg? Uh, no, but um, you know, it was it was divided up of course with the coal where where's the major coal field? Well, Aren't they up here in Parkersburg? No, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. I'm sorry. Not the coal fields. They, yeah, the coal fields are everywhere, and then uh, petroleum fields are up the word part of the bird, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, of course, that was an infant industry. It was just nobody really appreciated its value then. Uh, and I apologize. I don't know that depth of it. I'm looking on which time coming on. Any, any, yes, sir? Uh, comment on the um, Civil War and the Civil War Memorial Election, how he got through Baltimore. I was read to mean as an inauguration. I heard that he was dressed as a woman, and you know, when the train you had to go from one part of town to the other. And yeah, he was wearing the same dress that that rumor about Jeff Stewart was wearing. I mean, President Davis was wearing a little pretty. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been about a half a dozen books written by people much smarter than me about the assassination. But it all boils down to one thing. It didn't happen. Uh, <coughs> Pinkerton, in my opinion, this is just Dan's opinion right now. Uh, Lincoln was making a trip. He was going all over the North by train to introduce himself to the people. Lincoln understood railroad. Lincoln was the foremost railroad attorney in the United States. He won more landmark cases for railroads against railroads than anybody else, and that's where he made his money. And uh, I always say if it wasn't for the Emancipation Proclamation, he would have pulled to the most most proud of Jeff uh, Collinson for signing the paperwork for the Transcontinental Railroad. Anyway, so he gets as far as Philadelphia, and rumor control says that the Baltimore Hunts are going to assassinate you when it comes to Baltimore. Well, all this is deduced by people going into bars, you know, and immediately becoming intimate with all these plotters and getting all the details. And uh, there, there was a lawyer from Atlanta who wrote a book about this thing, the last one I wrote. And he went through this whole thing. He's a lawyer. He's from Atlanta. He doesn't have a back. He isn't a home homeboy. He's not trying to, you know, defend or destroy Baltimore anyway. He goes through this whole thing for like 400 pages, and he gets to the end and he says, "But of course, it's only circumstantial evidence, so there's no way to prove it." And that's it's a rumor. That's all it is. It's a rumor. And let's look at it this way: How good was Pinkerton? If anybody knows Civil War history, when he told every time McClellan would say, "How many troops do I have? 100,000. How many do we have? 200,000." I mean, his numbers were terrible. So, um, you know, it, it, it just, in my mind, it just didn't happen. But it did have a terrible effect because he was supposed to come directly from Harrisburg or northern central to Baltimore and then go on and meet the people, about 10,000 people that be waiting for him in Baltimore. But he sneaks through at night and he, he is on a, on, a, on a train and comes through at 3 o'clock in the morning. The next day, Mary and the boys come by the regular route. There's 10,000 people waiting, and if there were any assassins, they didn't. If you notice, there's a lot of stories about him. Him and Mary did not get along well in the White House. And I don't to go back to the point that he left her for the assassin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. 
as you said, uh, it has nothing to do with being a railroad. You said you were a member of the Surratt Society. Yes. Mary Surratt. Yes, there is a, a her house is in Southern Maryland. And it's where the Lincoln and Mormon conspirators stopped on their way after the assassination. And the folks formed an organization 40 years ago, saved the house. It's now completely furnished. They have a research center. They give bus tours of the uh, of the escape route. And it's, it's a great, great group of people. Do you think she deserved to be named? Uh, no. Uh, I, 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 I really, obviously, there's something going on in her house. Uh, or boarding house in Washington, but um, whether it warranted her assassination, I mean her uh, execution, because all the assassins weren't, weren't hung anyway. I mean the primary guys, you know, stabbed and shot people. But the, the country was just in a rage of revenge. I mean, you know, people that looked like John Wilkes Booth we could beat up in the street, you know, they wouldn't take any chances. They looked like him when they hit you. I mean, I'm not making a joke, maybe it was, it was, it was a very dangerous time. She said the wrong thing. Of course, you know, the worst thing that could happen to the Confederacy was to lose Lincoln because he was the only one standing between the radical Republicans and them when it came to the post war years. So, you know, Booth couldn't have done any, any worse at it than if he tried. But, uh, no, I don't think, I think she, you know, could have been a, some kind of guilty of something, but she never came out of the South. A cold conspirator. Yeah. I involved in it, but not full, not full. Yeah, but I don't, think, I don't think anybody believes she should have come. Uh, anything else? Yes, way in the back. Uh, we've all been quite compelling here because we have to be on the TV tour and we can't go back to the main questions we know right. Can you speak more about them? Sure. Um, we're cool with me, probably. Maybe I'm going to do the right one. Well, Kelly did such a good job. Well, first of all, at the end, very end of the battle, and the, the battle of the Philippines is an exciting battle. The, uh, the total casualties, I think, were 12 for the whole battle. Even though this, 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 you know, this battle like, made the state of West Virginia because they put it out on the rebels and let you guys vote for your state with But not like Gettysburg or Bridgeburg or Antietam. I mean, the total casualties were 12. The only Union soldier killed accidentally shot himself. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's not how big the battle is. Sometimes it's when it is, which was my lecture was all about. Kelly was terribly wounded right at the end as he rode in, chasing the uh, he was shot right in the chest and they thought he was going to die. Uh, McClellan promoted him to Brigadier General. Nobody thought he was going to live, but he did. And he was given an organization known as the Railroad Division. And he was in charge of guarding the B&O track from Cumberland, Maryland, west to the Ohio River for the, for the branches of the road. And he did a magnificent job. And it was a rotten job, because the whole time, people are getting all these glitzy names like Antietam and the Wilderness and Gettysburg. He's, you know, running people out a little culverts and block houses and you know taking a beating from the boat and trade and that kind of stuff. But he did a fabulous job. He was eventually promoted to uh, he saved Cumberland in eighteen sixty four when the Catholic Confederate burned Chambersburg, their next target was Cumberland and he beat him off there. He was promoted to major general and then uh, he was so well thought of by B and O that he lived in uh, Oakland. And when he died, he and provided a special train to take him and some members of the Grand Army of the Republic and the media family to Washington for burial. So he was he was highly, highly thought of. He did a good job, a thankless job. Yes, sir. There was a, a Union Army training center on Wheeling Island in Camp Carlisle. And when training was completed, the troops were marching across the suspension bridge to the BO passenger terminal. And they went to war on the DNO. And in doing so, they were attacked by the rock. And thus we have the title before it came by train. I gotta I got tell you, um, the way this whole thing started, and like I said, I, I love West Virginia, I'm not making this up. I, I called a fellow in uh, Rawlsburg, I hope I said that right. I said, Tim, uh, I'm with the DNO. I know you've done some work with the DNO. I know nothing about what I'm doing. He says, Well, call Hunter Lesser. So I called Hunter Lesser and I introduced myself. He says, Okay, uh, we're having a conference in, uh, uh, I can't remember where it was, but another part of the state. And I went there and introduced me to uh, uh, Rick Wolf. And I met the head of tourism and everything. They were having a conference that day and invited me. And I started meeting people and putting all these stories together. And it was uh, it was great to learn you know, all, all these different things. And the thing is, we have collectively 
And, and the one thing I, I wasn't even prepared to make any kind of an address, but they asked me to stand up and talk at this conference. So there's all these people at the Stonewall Jackson Lodge or whatever it was. Reston? Reston? Okay. Uh, so I said, well, look, folks, this, this is what we're going to do. I said, uh, I'm not here to take over whatever West Virginia's going to do. Uh, we're just here to support you if we can. I said, and I promise you, there'll be no, no indication of division between West Virginia and Maryland. I'm just going to tell this story as it is. And I said, the only time we'll have a problem is when the Mountaineers play the Turks. <laughs> <laughs> and now the Turks are going off to the Big Ten, never be heard of again, in my opinion, but that's, that's another story. But <laughs> um, seriously, you know, if we, you know, love your history up here. I, on, on my tombstone, we put local history is the best history, because that's what I always say. And, and I think together we just have a unique story. And I take this story around the country, really, and people have never heard anything like it. You know, the whole idea that all this happened before the first battle of War Run. You know, it's kind of vision, a little appreciation for, for our railroad and your statehood. Anything else? Sir? What is the correct spelling of Roseby's Rock? I don't know. That's, that's the sign. Whatever they have on the sign, I wouldn't begin to. Circuit to complete it. Okay, well, I just, for me, it just seemed like an odd word, but that's what I am. Anything else? I don't want to keep you guys from uh, doing what you need to do. I, my wife and I will be here for a few minutes later because we're going to suit up and go home after this, but we'll, we have no other appointments, so if you want to stop by and chat. And thank you, Sean, for having me. I had a great experience.